Welcome to the Startup to Exit podcast, where we will bring you world-class entrepreneurs and VCs to share their hard-earned success stories and secrets. This podcast has been brought to you by Thai Seattle. Thai is a global nonprofit that focuses on fostering entrepreneurship. Thai Seattle offers a range of programs, including the Go Vertical Startup Creation Weekend, Thai Entrepreneur Institute, and the Thai Seattle Angel Network. We encourage you to become a Thai member so you can gain access to these great programs. To become a member, please visit www.seattle.thai.org. Everybody, uh, welcome to another edition of Startup to Exit podcast. I am very excited to co-host this podcast with uh, Shirish Natkarni. Now he's a serial author. His second book, Winner Takes All, is uh, available in all bookstores where you can buy books. And uh, this uh, is brought to you by Thai Seattle. And we are very, very excited about today's guest. Uh, he's a fixture in uh, the Seattle VC circles. And we'll get into it about his outlook for investments in 2024. Shirish, take it away. Thank you, Gauri. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shirish Natkarni. I'm a serial entrepreneur and board member of uh, Thai Seattle, like uh, Gauri. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have as our guest, uh, Kellen Carter, who's a founding partner at uh, Fuse uh, VC. It's a relatively uh, but prominent uh, VC firm uh, based out of Seattle. And before... Um, uh, founding uh, Fuse, uh, Kellen was a uh, partner at uh, Ignition Ventures, another Seattle-based uh, VC firm that has done uh, many exciting investments. So um, thank you so much for joining us today, Kellen. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and great to see you both two days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, let's start with a little bit of an introduction. If you can tell us a little bit about your firm and your investment thesis. Yeah, it, we started the firm almost four years ago, February 24th, 2020. And we were so blessed to have the prior mentorship and tuition of working at Ignition Partners and then the support of the partners at Ignition to help us launch Fuse. But we kind of joke that we've crammed 40 years of experience into four years between starting the firm right before COVID, really excited, then figuring out how to raise money over formats like this, Zoom, Google Meets, et cetera, and then managing a firm throughout one of the biggest tech resets we've seen since the GFC in the bubble. And so it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of hard work, but so blessed to work with great partners and uh, great founders and great LPs at Fuse. But the whole premise of starting Fuse was that Seattle is emerging as one of the most important software markets in the world. Outside of this new shiny object called AI, cloud was one of the most important technology <laughs> thing. Well, having Microsoft and Amazon being both based in Seattle, plus Google Cloud, plus Oracle Cloud, Seattle is in position A of being one of the most important technology cities in the world. And now with this whole AI uh, momentum that we're seeing, it's also in position A. And so our thesis in starting the firm in early 2020 was that there are going to be a lot of very promising companies and founders starting exciting businesses here. And that by building a firm with our ages and our longevity of wanting to go do this for the next 30 years, we would be the right time, right place, right city. Uh, it was all coming together. And so we started the firm and we had a thesis of, uh, of in building a firm that you know, why fuse? How do you have edge? How do you reverse engineer really good returns by building the best product for founders? And so we built this LP community, 300 strong of executives of every single company you can name here in the Pacific Northwest. And the trick is that we engage our LPs to be supportive to our founders. And one of our LPs described it as the best form of collusion he'd ever seen. But the whole purpose is bringing the best product to founders in the, in the form of talent, in the form of customers, in the form of advisors. So we can be part of those companies' journeys and be one of the most supportive partners. Uh, we also founded the firm on the premise that enterprise software is one of the most important categories. And then that's what we're going to be investing in. All B2B software, all vertical, and that includes vertical software, includes horizontal enterprise software. And yes, both of those include AI. And been really, really fortunate that 
was able to raise fund one of 173 million and just close our second fund of 254 million. Congratulations. That's great. So before we talk about 2024, let's kind of look back at uh, uh, what happened in 2023. As we all know, 2022 was a boom year for raising venture capital money, but mm -hmm. then um, interest rates started going up dramatically and NASDAQ uh, dropped like a stone. Um, so I'm uh, interested in understanding uh, what was 2023 like from an investment perspective compared to the previous year? Well, as you might imagine, things slowed down. And it takes a while for the NASDAQ and then the growth equity firms, then the mid-stage firms, and then finally the earlier, uh, earlier stage firms like Fuse to feel the impact of what that new rate environment meant. But now it, in 2023, it really started to make its way into early stage software companies. And the reality is, is capital just gets more expensive. And one of the things I'm most pleased with as it relates to our founders and the portfolio is their understanding, their response to a higher rate environment and knowing what it takes to now really exceed the high watermark of the last round and build an enduring company. But the reality is rates go up. Capital is more expensive, which means you have to put more proof points on the board. Well, what that meant for new companies um, is that a lot of founders just went into bunker mode in 2022. At the end of 2022 and at the beginning of 2023, knowing they needed to go put more points on the scoreboard before going out to market. So now what we're then seeing is companies with much more meat on the bone, more customers, more revenue a tighter reporting of the KPIs and financials. Uh, the companies are just a little bit more mature relative to where they were in 2022 and 2021, but still going out and raising the same amount of capital of those. And so I think you just see better businesses get built because capital is more expensive. And the reality is, as founders don't want to dilute themselves to zero, you, you end up funding the business with, with, with revenue. And so uh, I think you'll see a lot of really big businesses get built in this era. There's obviously this big platform shift that's now happening, but because capital is more expensive, founders are getting their business models much more dialed earlier in their journey. Okay, so that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, just wondering how have uh, valuations uh, been impacted? Um, there seems to be a tale of two cities. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, some, some respects valuations have come down uh, a lot, but, um, there's a lot of hype around AI as well. So I'm just curious as to what, what you've seen in the market uh, in 2023. Anything in AI infrastructure, if you're an elite founder spinning out of Google or Microsoft or Amazon or OpenAI, it's really hard to diagnose what the frameworks are for valuations. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are off the charts and it's exciting, but there's still going to be a lot of dead bodies in the next couple of years. Um, the market is rewarding high quality business models. And we have our founder uh, 2024 outlook actually for our founders next week. And if you look at the top decile of public SaaS companies, they still trade at 15X. If you look at the bottom quartile as it relates to the rule of 40, they trade at like two and a half X. So the market is really still rewarding companies with a high degree of operating uh, leverage where they can grow fast and capture market share, or they can quickly be cash flow positive. And the ones that aren't are getting highly penalized. The other companies that are getting highly penalized is calling something that's not software software. The market is now calling it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So services businesses trying to market themselves as software businesses, that's gone away. That's totally gone away. All right, over to you, Gary. Oh, thanks, Shane. Uh, so, Kellen, uh, the juggernaut of AI. First, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, what invest, AI investments you guys made in 2023 or even in 2022 uh, yeah. as a firm? Well, we've been investing in AI for quite a long time, even dating back to my days at Ignition, where we mm -hmm. led investments in a company called iCertis, which mm -hmm. is emerging as one of the leaders in enterprise software, mm -hmm. was a contract lifecycle management company. And a fun fact mm -hmm. about iCertis, we closed that investment leap day of 2016. So the company's mm -hmm. really like two and a half years old or a year and a half years old. Um, but the uh, 
the premise about that investment was there's a ton of data inside of contracts. And yes, it's enterprise contract management, but the insights using AI and machine learning that you can extrapolate out of those contracts was a longer term play and vision that we had at Fuse and that the founders had at Isertis. And so just want to use that example that this AI shift is really not that new. It's just a lot more prolific in the market and it's in every pitch deck. But where you're seeing us invest in AI today is in a lot of vertical oriented solutions. AI is part of the value delivered in generally what is vertical markets. That's an area that we really like. And a great example of that in fund two that we made investment in earlier this year is called Quandary. And they're doing RPA for the insurance brokerage industry, helping with doc automation, renewal automation, uh, extracting data in the insurance documents and making sure that data is synced with the existing systems. But it's very vertical specific, which makes it harder for one of these broader platform LLMs like Anthropic or OpenAI to do anything because it requires domain-specific knowledge, domain-specific workflows, domain-specific data. So we really like uh, vertical solutions with AI is a big part of the, the uh, is a big part of the component. We did just make an investment that was leaked to the press in a company called GripTape AI, ex-Amazon uh, executive, third time he's founded a company. And what they are uh, developing is software for instrumentation of AI inside the enterprise, enterprise grade. The reality is in most AI scenarios right now, all the usage is done with SMBs or an innovation slash curiosity budgets inside the enterprise. It's not really becoming trusted infrastructure. And if you look out there, many of these companies, especially banks, are essentially eliminating anyone's ability to use ChatGPT or OpenAI because mm -hmm. there are concerns about what people are doing with the data. And of course, mm -hmm. you don't know what some software algorithm might do if it hallucinates. And so there's been a lot of restrictions. Well, what Kyle and the Grip Tape team are now doing is helping bring AI models into the enterprise with appropriate and proportional guardrails. Who can do what, with what access to data, and with what models with a higher degree of accuracy with the specific model. And so it's essentially helping bridge that trust gap for real business scenarios that just doesn't exist today. So that's one example of a super stellar founder spinning out of an elite company here, Amazon, and helping bring AI into the enterprise in a highly thoughtful way. So uh, just to expand on it, so when you look forward to 2024, uh, you're doing a lot of vertical uh, applications that are AI enabled, as opposed to just fundamentally saying, I'll build an app, etc. Where uh, in the B2B space, as you correctly pointed out, enterprises are both skeptical, scared to excited, somewhere in that spectrum, right? And how do uh, your thesis and therefore your founders, uh, or how are you guiding your founders to think about uh, go to market and the, the basics of, of uh, getting a startup off the ground, right? Product market fit, go to market, because there's a lot of frothiness in this AI thesis at the moment. Yeah. Well, there's a couple things, and there's a lot to the question, so I could go on all day long. Uh, <laughs> one is you've never seen the incumbents move faster or announce new products faster than Microsoft and Google and Amazon have in the last year. Uh -huh. You uh -huh. haven't seen a reaction or a behavior like that from incumbents with vast distribution, building and announcing and creating noise in the market, or creating actual real valuable products. And so one of the things that we're constantly talking about at Fuse and with our companies is what is the what do the incumbents mean to you in the future? You know, are you part of the product roadmap or are you highly durable and defensible against a announcement from a Microsoft? And so it's beware of the incumbents is kind of the theme for 2024 and how do you have defensibility and durability with your customer base? as you're going to market. The second piece of that question is people are excited and scared at the same time. It's a fun place to be. And figuring out what are those early scenarios of use that 
might not be the long game of what you want to build, but you can show demonstrable value with AI, with solutions, with your customers and start to build trust. I think the key word, if you're a customer doing anything in AI and a vendor doing anything in AI, is how do you establish and build trust? And trust is earned, it's not granted. And so what are the early solutions and value you can deliver, albeit knowing there's a longer term play to build that trust? I think the reality is, is there's going to be a lot of mistakes made. There's going to be a lot of uh, scenarios where software did something that, you know, essentially pisses off the customer. So building trust is a really key element to go to market in 2023 and, and extending into 2024. The last thing is we're guiding our founders is just assume budgets are still going to be tight. Procurements, procurement's kind of the superhero right now and that sales cycles are going to take longer. And so we're working really shoulder to shoulder with our founders to help make sure these budgets have the appropriate assumptions, the forecasts have the appropriate assumptions, and just making sure we're all sober and staying close to the metal on how enterprises are bringing AI and adopting software, especially in 2024. So let's just kind of take a macro outlook on 2024. Uh, It's an election year. The economy is going to do what's going to do. Um, (laughs) So first is... uh, what are your expectations for 2024 from a macro level, like the economy perspective, given that it's going to be an election year? Yep. Well, the election year is always the variable. It's impossible yep. to predict. And it always mm-hmm. causes, you know, humans like certainty. They don't like uncertainty. Elections mm-hmm. create uncertainty. And the natural, natural reaction when there's any uncertainty is to generally pause. Mm-hmm. And so uh, just prepare for enterprises and companies to just move a little bit slower because of this thing called the election, which creates uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I think is really important is I think we're getting close, if not Mm -hmm. have hit the ceiling of of where interest rates will will stabilize. But I think for a lot of the excess spending, whether it's the investment in the crazy uh, cycle we just went through, plus the government spending, I think rates will have to stay fairly high for a little bit longer. They might not go up, but they're going to have to stay at a current rate or close to it throughout most of 2024. Do I see us getting back to a 2% interest rate environment or 3% interest rate environment by the end of next year? No. And so preparing for rates to stay where they are, uh, for that to, of course, impact the capital markets the way it does, especially private equity. That's a good, safe starting point. Prepare for that, but hope it gets better. So given that thesis, how will it affect the pace of your investments uh, in 2024? Just as a VC, you guys plan number of uh, investments. How is that going to affect your pace of investments? Is it changing? Same? What is it? We're we're staying the course. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that, Gary, is... When we're investing in a company, the journey, if we get it right and we're super fortunate, is generally longer than the U.S. marriage, the U.S. average length of a marriage. It's like 10 years. (laughs) We have no idea what the markets are going to look like 10 years from now in 2033. We just have no idea. And I think keeping the steady course uh, and the pace of investment is something that we're planning to do throughout 2024. We are very much in business. We will be very active. Uh, we're excited about the uh, resourcefulness mixed with the innovation cycle we're in. I think a lot of great companies are going to be getting built and started in the next few years. So quick rapid fire. What would be a focus for 2024 from a pure uh, investment perspective? What are you looking for? And you would say, yeah, that's our bet. Vertical software enabled by AI. That is something we're really, really keen on. It's where there's going to be more durability, more pricing defensibility. And you're going to compete less with the scary incumbents. So last question, Kellen, most important. One prediction for 2024. And we'll come back to you in 2025 and play this and then, and then record the next one. So you're saying your words. <laughs> we just wanted all the prediction. That's all. <laughs> hey, I come from a land of astrologers, so I love predictions. Um, Beware of the incumbents is the theme of 2024. Fantastic. 
Thank you, Kellen. Appreciate you taking the time to talk to Shirish and I for our podcast, Startup to Exit. Thank you very well, much. It's always an honor to have the time with you too. Thank, Thank you, you, Kellen. Thank you. All the best for 2024. Yes, you too. You too. Thank you for listening to our podcast from Startup to Exit, brought to you by Tai Seattle. Assisting in production today are Isha Jain and Mini Verma. Please subscribe to our podcast and rate our podcast wherever you listen to them. Hope you enjoyed it.